Now today we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about MRI CT scan findings in the in hydrocephalus, especially if you are suspecting increased intracranial pressure. I know this might not be I mean, the best uh, topic to present in ground ground as it's highly specialized, but I think there's a lot of relative points that would be very helpful for even the people who does it, the ER or general pediatric uh, to to know. So this is my name, and uh, you guys know me. Uh, the, uh, the, the CSF. The production of the CSF, as you guys know, and as uh, uh, all our residents know, it happens in the lateral ventricle mainly with the uh, coronary plexus. And uh, there is also some uh, production in the fourth ventricle. And it will circulate uh, through uh, uh, aqueduct phalanges, then uh, foramen of magenta and lushke and they go around the brain, then they go through the granulation, uh, arachnoid granulation to be absorbed in the uh, veins of the brain, then it will, will go to the, to the uh, uh, back to, to the heart. Now, uh, here this is more of uh, 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 showing the venous, so the venous uh, uh, pulsation or the pulsation of the CSF fluid in the, in the brain. Now, usually the CSF used is produced as 500 milliliters per day. Uh, the turnover almost is 3.7 uh, times a day. Because uh, the whole amount is around uh, uh, 150, 140 ml of CSF. So if you produce 500 ml a day, that's when you're going to change your CSF uh, 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 four times a day. Now looking at this, uh, at the, this, at this photo, what's interesting, you know, as we see here in the coronary plexus, we will use the CSF. It will circulate down to aqueduct phalanges, fourth ventricle, measure the energy and go around the brain, then go to the granulation tissue. And if you look here, you will see that the optic nail is covered with the uh, uh, with the meninges and it go all the way to the uh, to the eye which means if you have increased intercranial pressure it will reflect on the eye and you will develop a papilledema and uh, uh, this looking in the eye to look for papilledema is really very important if you suspect increased intercranial pressure and uh, that's why they say that the eye is the, is the window to the brain Always try to look in the eye if you suspect increased the temperature or any other disorder. Now, if you look at the component of the of the of the of the brain or what, what, what anything in the skull, you will find the arterial blood is 30 ml, more or less. Venous blood is 120 ml. CSF is 150. We said it 500 ml per day is produced, so you, you change your CSF like 3.7 times a day and the brain tissue is 1400 ml that is you know uh, uh, the, 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 the component of uh, your uh, what you, whatever you have in your skin now uh, just a reminder uh, there is different sequence to the MRI T1, T2, flare so if we ask Dr. Dino what's T1 it will be the flare will look dark with T1 the white matter will be white, the dark matter will be dark. If you look at T2, the fluid is bright, the, the white matter will be dark, and the, the, the gray matter will be, will be lighter. And the same thing is with the flare, but they take off the CSF signal out. Now this guy in the picture is, does anybody know who this guy? Peter okay. Mansfield, Paul Lickenberg, Felix Bloch, Max and Mr. Jordan, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? What? Six, okay. Dina, what do you think of this guy? Very good. That guy is, is, is really, really very known, well known and famous. Dr. Kanzani. We were imagining maybe he's the guy from Kentucky Fried Chicken. He looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, KFC would be fine. Okay, so this is guy is Paul Lothenberg, 
This guy and Peter Mansfield are the two guys who did early research to lead to the development of an island we use uh, nowadays. So this the guy is, is who did the major war to have a MRI to look at the other people playing now. Now, what are the radiographic features of uh, increased intercranial pressure, uh, secondary to hydrocephalus, uh, uh, on the MRI of the CAT scan? First of all, everybody should know if you suspect increased intercranial pressure, please don't do spinal tap for the resident before uh, uh, you image the patient. Patient is less than 18 months, it is relatively safe, but I have seen kids with three months or four months with, with an intracranial pressure of 35. Because there is a limit to how much you can expand. So if you see a very dense, tense fontanel, you are suspect. With the flooded papillary edema, always I will do brain, brain uh, CT scan at least before I do spinal tap. So the brain imaging is very important to do in case if you suspect intracranial pressure. That is why, because I want to look for brain tumor, I want to look for pleural sinus thrombosis, and I want to look for hypersensitivity. Now, if you see a brain tumor, or if you see increased intercranial pressure, but it is unequal, like one side, <coughs> like the left ventricle has a brain tumor, it's a lot more dangerous to have herniation than if you have a diffuse intercranial pressure, like in the case of benign intercranial hypertension. Now, what are the features when I look at the MRI or the CAT scan? What are the things I would look for? See if, if they might indicate increase in the pressure. One of the first things is a slit like ventricle. Second thing is the optic nerve. You have to look at the optic nerve. The optic nerve, you can see prominent subarachnoid space around the, the optic nerve, and they will show you that. You can have a papilledema, and there is also pseudopapilledema. You can also have vertical tortuosity of the optic nerve. I will show you all these on the image. And you can enhance, have enhancement of the pre-laminar optic nerve. Which portion is the pre-laminar optic portion? The optic nerve, which part is the pre-laminar part? Dina? I'll show you in a minute. Then you can also have partially partial empty syndetorsic. Now, the dual sinus venous thrombosis, if you suspect it, you cannot just tell it on the regular MRI or the CAT scan. You have to do it on the or CT. Right? And these changes might be reversed. Now, look, let's look at this uh, picture. If you look at the CAT scan here, the picture looks okay. There's a basement of the sun side. You see, there's, you, don't, you don't even see any uh, spaces in the sun side. It's very dense, very full. Uh, everything is, 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 uh, is full in the spaces. If you look at the basal cistern here, you barely can see, right? This is every single physician who does LB should know that. If you see this area not open, don't do spinal tap. But the risk of herniation is very high. And if it's closed and you do spinal tap and the kid end up in trouble, you're going to be in trouble. Because this, if this basal cistern is not open, that's very high risk for herniation. Everybody has to know that. Now we sit in the eye, you will see kinking or tortuosity of the optic nerve. This is guys the optic nerve. You see it here? This is the eye, this is the optic nerve. It's kinking. That's one of the signs that you might see in case of increase in the temperature. The optic sheet, if you look here guys, from here to here, the optic sheet is very prominent. So there's prominent optic sheet in this case. And if you look at the scalar or the back of the, of the, of the eye, look how flattened it is. And it is also elevated. This also might indicate there's a probability made. And if you look at the same, the other eye, you will see also flattening of the of, of the, the posterior part of the eye. You will see uh, a lot of fluid around the optic nerve. This is the optic nerve. This all might indicate in increased intercranial pressure. One time I was uh, reviewing a patient with Dr. Kuro <coughs> in Kuro uh, uh, Hospital, and the report said there is a, a, a patulous optic sheet it might be indicative of increasing the pain pressure. So I, I was a fellow, I did not you know, ignore that. Then, then I discussed with Dr. Kuri, look, you always have, to, you really have to go back and double check on that. Because this patient might have increasing the pain pressure. It could be benign, increasing the hypertension, okay? 
Now, if you look at the eye here on this sagittal view, here's the optic nail. You can see that the optic sheath is very prominent, fluid. Fluid on T2 look bright. You can also see, look at the globe. It is flattened over here. This also might indicate increased intracranial pressure. So in case, if you are suspecting a patient who has increased, that he might have increased intracranial pressure, if you look at this finding and you find it, this will support your uh, uh, suspicion. Now, if you look over here on this section, this is a flattening, we say. Okay. So we talked about the nerve here, we talked about the globe here, uh, the finding here, there is mine, I'm really not convinced they're mine, you know, tonsillar herniation here. Yeah, and this is probably the bone, but they reported in the in the in the in the uh, in the MRI that there's mild cancer herniation that I can't see here. Usually this should extend below the the, the black uh, line here, but this is this mild cancer herniation that you can see in increasing thickness of tension. If you look at the eye here also, that's very important. This is the optic nerve. You see the fluid around it. Here, look at the you see that optic nerve here. You see the fluid around it. This is the dural sinus. You see here the transverse side that looked what looked like a stenosis cup. The left one is almost absent. What they did, they went ahead and they did the spinal tap on this guy and they drained the whole fluid. Then they repeated the MRI. So compare this one to this one. This is the optic nail. There's not much fluid around the optic nail. Okay? So it is reversible. The left the dural sinus or the transverse sinus, see here was uh, was almost absent, it's back to normal here, and the stenosis is gone. So this finding can be reversed. Now in this case, you pretty much see the same thing. Optic nerve, fluid around the optic nerve, tortuosity of the optic nerve here. You see the fluid also here, and flattened with the globe in the back. You see also high hypoplasia or uh, thinning of the lateral uh, uh, the lateral, the transverse sinus, this could be indicative of uh, increasing the pressure. But would you call that abnormal? Yeah, I mean, how do you see this all the time? If you don't have, yeah, it's because a constant. Because it's as a, a value. Yeah, the, the most common is bad, but in this case, because it, all, all of these are in the same patient, they are showing, you know, this is the, the optic end. This, this can look this way, but if you do the spinal tap, it might go back to normal. But we see it all the time. This could be hyperplastic. The most common cause for the left or the right transverse sinus to be asymmetrical is uh, uh, congenital hyperplastic. Okay? Now, in this MRI, here the optic nerve again. You see it's, it's fluid around the optic nerve. Very clear. Flattening of the globe here. It's also very clear. You can also uh, see here almost partially empty cilia torsica. If you look here, this is the cilia torsica, it's almost empty. This is always, as always, 70% of the time, this can be a sign of uh, increased intracranial pressure. And if you look at this CAT scan here, do you see anything you have that would bother you with this CAT scan? Like, are you happy about the basal system? Are you happy about the lateral ventricles? Abdullah? No. Sayyid al the basal system here, they are almost closed, okay? And the ventricles here are slit, uh, like ventricles. This is, can be indicative of increasing TK pressure. Can be. None of these is perfect not. They can be indicative of increasing TK pressure. And then this is also a uh, MRI T2 cup. You can see also the, the, the area of the, of the cylinder torsica here. It's almost empty and it's full of fluid. They did a study, they went and they did a study, and they said, you know what, let's, what, let's look into that, uh, into more details. So they uh, did a retrospective study where patients who had uh, trauma, increasing the pressure, secondary to trauma, in the, and they were sedated in the, in the ICU. They went and they put an uh, intracranial monitor, and they went also and they measured the optic nerve uh, sheet diameter. They used a special protocol for that. So, 
So they measure the optic sheath diameter here. And uh, uh, at the same time, they were measuring invasively the intracerebral pressure. And they said, let's see, does this really correlate with the increase in tachycardia pressure or uh, it does not? So they went and uh, uh, did this for almost 38 patients who were sedated and they were uh, uh, in, uh, intubated in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the ICU. And they compared it to 36 healthy volunteers. And they measured the optic near sheath diameter. This was done with the T2 cup, and uh, they were using Tercospin Echo, uh, uh, and they used also three Tesla MRI. This is more specification for the MRI. And at the same time, they measured the ICD uh, uh, invasively. So they found out that optic near sheath diameter, the sheath around the optic near, is significantly greater in patients with traumatic brain injury patient, if you have more than 20 millimeter, which is, you know, the cut for not obese people, intracranial pressure, if you have more than 20 millimeter pressure, they define it as increased cranial pressure, they found that most of these, of these patients, the uh, optic nerve sheet diameter was 6.31 plus minus 0.5 millimeter. And this is in 19 patients. Then in those with ICB of this than 20, which is they have normal ICP, they found that this value was 5.2, less than 5.29 plus minus. So they said that if you have, if a patient has a brain a trauma, increasing the pain pressure, you can use the MRI and T2 cut, and you can measure the optic nerve sheath diameter to predict if this patient has increasing the pain pressure or not. So this is, is mainly uh, in one study. But this can be very helpful in patients where you don't have, for example, a patient people who can put ICP intra, intra uh, cerebral pressure monitor. And this is the way they, they did it. They want a three uh, uh, millimeter behind the globe, and they zoomed it up. They, they measured optic nerve sheath diameter and the optic nerve diameter, and they and they came up with the value that we just talked about. Conclusion. So what did the study conclude? They said that a sedated patient with a traumatic brain injury, ONC, ONC, uh, ONSD measured using conventional brain T2, strongly correlated with invasive ICP. They found that 5.82 and above highly correlated with that, 5.3 and less highly uh, negate that against the increase in the temperature. Now, this is an MRI. But uh, that study is in adults? Yes, in adults, of course. So those yeah, values in pediatrics adults. will be different. You can divide by two in pediatrics. <laughs> <laughs> by the weight, by the weight, yeah. What the weight? Or you can commit high for me. It's kind of a small of, uh, I, I present the study to tell you that there is, you know, there's a lot of things that are being done, and we are not aware of it, but, you know, it can be very extremely helpful. Uh, now, if you look at this MRI, and they tell you, Laura, what do you see in this MRI? First, what is the cut? Flare cut, right? Fluid is dark. Gray matter is, is, uh, is, dark, is lighter. White matter is darker. What do you see generally? Whenever there is a fluid, you lost something to fill with the fluid. Remember that? So you see very much generalized atrophy. You see generalized atrophy. The lateral ventricles, are they normal? Deep. Dilated. Dilated lateral ventricles, which is mainly hypocephalus, right? And what about these things here? Around the, the lateral ventricles. And say, victim and exit. Now, can this be chronic ischemic? Can this be atrophy with a chronic uh, uh, CNS vasculitic disease? We see a lot, a lot of the time the other people, it can. But, if you look here, what they, are, what they are trying to say here, if you have a flare image, remember the flare image, if you have like acute hydrocephalus, this would be very helpful to look for trans edema that Dr. Dina pointed to. You can see here that the, the line, this is more of edema around the ventricle, because the ventricle, they are squeezing out the brain, and they are, uh, the fluid is going through the brain tissue. So this will give you the trans edema. If you look at the, at the cell side, for example, look at this one. 
and look at this one. It is not the typical atrophy you see. It's more of square, dilated, or balloon down. They are balloon down. This is, fits more with, uh, uh, with the increased intercranial pressure. In this case, can, if I ask you, is this communicating or non-communicating hydrocephalus? Most likely non-communicating, because you have dilation from outside and dilation from inside. The non-communicating, and there were few cases, you will have the lateral ventricle, third ventricle, but the rest of the brain should be fine. Okay? And if you look at the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle here, you see guys the white the white marker here and the white segment, this is all transependent edema because the the, the, the the ventricle are squeezing the fluid through the tissue. Okay? the third ventricle, and you see also a, a problem here, right? Okay. So they did, they did the surgical T1 MRI, and they uh, looked, and they found that that ventricle is dilated. There is a mass, look at this ventricle, to the third ventricle, causing dilatation of the lateral ventricle. Here, we didn't have, we didn't, and this might cause trapped ventricles, which is an emergency, uh, it has to be treated, uh, uh, right away. So this patient has uh, uh, colloid cyst that causes lateral ventricle dilatation uh, mainly on the left side. So uh, the, the way to treat that, you have to take the front of the out. Okay? Now here, what do you guys see? What do you think about the lateral ventricle? Dilated. What do you think about the third ventricle? Dilated. Really dilated, right? What do you think about aqueduct of Stenosis. Stenosis. Excellent. Now here, the third ventricle dilated, the lateral ventricle dilated. Look how much the, uh, the optic chiasm and the uh, hypothalamic uh, star is pushed down. It's ballooned down. Because the anterior, third, uh, the anterior part of the third ventricle is really dilated. What is the structure here? Mammillary body, right? Mammillary body, and this is, and this is the part, the area from here to here they call mammillo pontine angle or mammillo pontine distance. So this, when, when the fluid pushed down, it can be decreased. So this is also one of the signs for increased intercranial pressure. Also, this this picture shows the same thing, but what's different? What is the difference between this picture and this picture? Abdullah, look here. Look at the tectum of the midbrain. Very awesome, lovely. And look here, you see a mass. So this is most likely tectal tumor or tectal glioma. Most of the time, these are benign. They cause the biggest problem. They cause hydrocephalus or acute hydrocephalus, right? So what is the way to treat them? ETV. 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 Okay. Who can who can uh, explain that? So you do endoscopic third ventricular So they, it's, it's very simple. They come they come here and they they, they open uh, uh, they open uh, a hole here and the fluid will drain the other. What do you call it? The ETV. Okay. ETV. Now. Uh, uh, that's another dilated uh, secondary to hydrocephalus. Ahmed, what do you think about the lateral ventricles? From a neonatologist's point of view. Really dilated, right? What do you think about the third ventricle? Really dilated, right? Okay, and uh, can you tell what might be the cause here? Aqueductal stenosis. Here and the aqueductal stenosis here. If you see the lateral third ventricle dilated, the fourth ventricle is normal. You are talking about aqueductal stenosis and the proven <coughs> right? And what is the, the, the mode of inheritance? The classical mode of inheritance? It's okay. dominant. Any other? Any? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Now, this MRI. In six and a half months, infant is seen by Dr. Wasim, and he has this uh, this MRI. As a physician, you want to tell the family because he's a neurosurgeon in the community want to shut this kid or put him on acetazolamide. 
Lord, I want to be a saint as Lord of my Lord Shelton. And they have seen kids came to me when I saint as Lord of my Father. What do you think about this one? Is it thrombocephalic synopsis? Benign extracurricular hydrocephalus? Centennial symphony? I need to ask a friend. None of the other. Benign, hey, but I know you have been saying I need to ask a friend. <laughs> okay. Who would agree with him? No Nora Zagri. Why do you want to call this benign external hydrocephalus? Ali. Ali. Why do you want to call it? Benign external hydrocephalus? Yes, to you. Yeah. Um, the, um, the subdural, uh, subdural fluid is uh, increased. And the vertical where, size where is increased? From, from, from the knee. Excellent. Uh, the vertical size is normal, although in uh, and hydrocephalus might be hard also. Excellent. Uh, the other thing, clinically. Wait, this is your word, no problem. Fontaine and Abalgin, usually they have a, a, a large head or microcephaly from the frontal part. And if you see here, what are these? Transversing trans, trans, uh, uh, veins. So that's always uh, tends to, that's most likely hydrocephalus. Okay. So Why it's called benign? Huh? Benign. Why it's called benign? It has no uh, problem, it does not cause any sequelae for the patient, and it resolved by two years of age by itself. It does not need anything. I have a patient came to me, they need to do shock for him, another patient they want to receive the zoroma the same to So uh, even though, you know, it might, be, once you see it, you will know it right away. So it's idiopathic, it's due to immature cerebral spinal fluid, drainage, and uh, they use the criteria 5 millimeter between the skull and the uh, and, uh, cerebral matter or between interhemispheric, uh, the interhemispheric area as a 5 millimeter. But clinically, plus the MRI, this always uh, 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 can, uh, can tell you that this is what's the case you have to think about. Now, in this patient, uh, The first one has atrophy, and the second two uh, uh, do have uh, uh, increase, uh, uh, increase uh, or high risk of decrease the hair pressure. If you look at the atrophy, you will find in this case abnormal corpus callosum. Do you think this is uh, normal or thin? Thin, thin corpus callosum. Look at the, at the, the vermis. There is also hyperplasia of the vermis, and also look at the. Look also at the at the at the pawns and the medulla. They are these, remember these are the pathway. You know uh, the, the pathway come from the brain and then they get condensed in the brain stem. This is more reflection of the also the the brain cells in the in the cerebral hemisphere. They are also very thin. In this case, if you look at the cerebral uh, the the, the vermis is normal. You can compare this to this one. Unfortunately, the, the corpus callosum is not, uh, you cannot see it here full, but you can tell, look at here how thin it is, and look here, you can see it is thicker, but sometimes when you have increased the pressure, it can be ballooned up, it can be ballooned up. And here you, you can see increased mamillo, pontine distance, and large lateral ventricles, big third ventricles, uh, and also big fourth ventricle. So in this case, you would be thinking of what as a cause? Aqueductal stenosis or communicating hydrocephalus? Communicating hydrocephalus, okay? So how can you differentiate between cerebral atrophy and cerebral hyperplasia? What's the question? Cerebral atrophy and cerebral hyperplasia. Yeah, I, I know what's what would you mean. Hyperplasia, correct me if I work hard or we'll see. The hyperplasia, this is something uh, usually congenital. It did not grow to its potential, its the potential size. So the patient was born this way, the, the vermis is small, they never grow to be big. When the atrophy, they grow, then they lose. So this is the classic. What do you mean? Is you, if you have two scans and you see a, a change from one normal to a small cerebellum, that's your. Right. Right. So, so, so I have, so have, two, have two studies to compare. Yeah, you can't differentiate on a single scan. Because you know, remember that we are losing things. Yes. That place is going to be always there. So when we talk about atrophy, does it uniform? Like it does cover the whole 
brain matter or it can affect it, parts it could of it? different parts. Could be where we and what about the hypoplasia? It could also take, that's why you cannot differentiate in just one scan. They could look exactly the same. A lot of the time we see cerebellar uh, various hypoplasia, you can see uh, diffuse brain atrophy, cerebellar atrophy, uh, so it, it, it can be either way. Okay. Now here in this case, uh, uh, this this what do you think about the scan? Don't, don't read what's here. What do you think about this scan? Look normal, right? Look at the corpus callosum. Awesome thick. Look at the at the third ventricle. It, yeah, it is not ballooned out. It's not pushing anything here, right? Uh, look at the mamillo pon pontine uh, 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 distant. It, it looks normal, look at the aqueductus phalaeus, it's beautiful in the sagittal, and the fourth ventricle is, is nice, right? So this is more of a normal uh, uh, MRI scan. And they were they were trying to see, they, this is the normal distance, and there's a, a variance for, for distance based on the age or the adult. Uh, 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 and the way they measure it, they will take the from the mammillary area, mammillary body here, up to the top of the pond. Now, Another question. This MRI is consistent with Drew Bear syndrome, CDG, congenital disorder of glycosylation, Mickey KV tumor, Mickey Mouse syndrome, thrombocephalocytosis. Now, before you answer this question, the Tornina, can you tell me what is the Mickey KV? What is the, the whole mark when you see as a neurologist or a neuroradiologist tumor the congenital disorder of legacy? What's the whole mark finding on the MRI, the sagittal looking at the pons as well as at the at the various of the cell? Excellent. So do you see atrophy here? You see the pons look? We call it the pregnant angel. It's very nice, big. And this is the uh, the virus is huge. I mean, I think he has extra virus. <laughs> and this is big. So th this is most likely is not the case here. Now, Joubert syndrome. The one that has got a naked ear. Ahmed. No, no, what? <laughs> 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 read, the, read the question. Okay. He wanted to call us. Joubert syndrome, what is the uh, finding typical oh, number? Monotooth. Yes, monotooth. Do you see a monotooth here? No. no. Now, do you guys see Mickey Mouse here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what's the what's the what's the answer? No. <laughs> well, this is normal. This is normal. This is human brain. This is I always tell the kids. You can you we all like like Mickey Mouse because you have Mickey Mouse in your brain. So that is the normal middle brain. If you don't have this one, you really need to see your neurologist. Problem. Then what do we have left? Rhombocephalocytosis, right? Now, what is rhombocephalocytosis? Um. <laughs> it's a diagnosis. Uh, it's a diagnosis by exposure. This is not a question. A question: What is rhombocephalocytosis? Question: There is a type of error. Yes, there is type of You see here. Look at look at the at the, at the cerebellum. So look at the cerebellum. People who are used to look at the MRI, the cerebellum here look like an uh, mouth fish appearance, there is no cleavage, okay? You, remember, you have left and right hemisphere, here all are uh, uh, in love and all attached to other. So, this is what we call uh, cerebellum, uh, cerebellum hemisphere are fused together, so this is what we call rhombocephalocytosis. Clear? Questions? Comment? Concerns? Okay, next. Now, uh, we're going to pass this one. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I want to show you guys uh, a website and I really, really want you to uh, look at this one if we can, if we can open uh, the internet hopefully here. This website, uh, if you are interested in learning anything about uh, 
MRI, we just would be really very helpful for you to, to know this website. I just discovered this one website like two or three days ago. This is the MRI. This is which section is this one? T1, right? White, white matter is white, gray matter is dark. This is sagittal, right? Beautiful, lovely MRI. And this is coral. What is nice about this, uh, this website, if Dr. Al Shouf or Dr. Khaled or Dr. Wasim in the morning report ask you a question about MRI and are you eye back, you can just point to this, this structure and then it will come to you in the uh, below what is this structure. Okay, Abdullah? Very nice, right? Yeah. If you want to, for example, learn about MRI, I don't know what, what this structure here, bilateral ventricle, you have to correlate it always with the, with the corona. What is this structure? Body. Corpus callosum. What is this structure? Vermis. Okay. This looks more like the government monitoring our thoughts. Uh. Uh, <laughs> what is this structure, Dina? Thalamus, right? It's very beautiful. What is this one? Severe critical which is the mid brain. And this is the thalamus. This is the mid brain. This is the, the medulla oblongata. So this website is phenomenal. Now, if you go to the home page, you will have, find a lot of neuroradiology cases. And if you go to other modules, you will find a lot of other modules uh, that uh, for CT, MRI, base of skull, for everything. Spine, spine, and the And you send it to all of us? I will email it out to you, but really this is very helpful. Just to get you still oriented with, with it, it's very, it's a free. The last time I was looking for something like this, they were asking me to pay probably two, three hundred uh, thousand dollars. You can take a photo of that. Just to send it from Eve to all the people. Where's the link? Sure. We'll, we'll send it as I said. Okay? <coughs> Questions? So what happened to the pre-lamber optic nerve stuff you told us? Ah, you about <laughs> this is going to be uh, you are going to be continued. You can tell you the next <laughs> <laughs> No, I will tell you what is what is the same. Okay, so the pre-lamina part is this is this is the globe, this is the scalera, this is the optic nerve. The part frontal to that if the opt is called the pre-lamina optic nerve. Did you get it? No. This is the optic nerve, this is the globe. The part of the optic nerve that is anterior to the scalera, which is intraorbital, you, you might not see it here, okay? Intraocular. When you look, intraocular is what? pre optic nerve. Something new, okay? Any question, guys? Comment, questions? 